All right, so let's look at this lecture. It's not too hot, not too cold, it's just right. And so this is a video lecture over heat um, and how heat is transferred in reactions, endothermic, exothermic. The quote that we have is, when you can't make them see the light, make them feel the heat. So the learning goals that we have for this lecture is that students will understand the difference between endothermic and exothermic chemical reactions um, and calculate the enthalpy of a reaction using the following equation to determine if it's endothermic or exothermic. And we're going to use this equation here to make sure that we understand um, and be able to predict if a reaction is going to be endo or exothermic. Um, let's jump into what we already know. Uh, number one is that chemical reaction combined uh, combines atoms to form different compounds. So we take these atoms, they form in different ratios to give us compounds. Temperature is related, related to kinetic energy and the movement of the molecules. Energy is required to change phase. So when we are looking on those uh, phase transition graphs, the ones that look like that, um, that energy is required to change the phase right here. And that products are more stable than reactants for an experimental conditions. So we always, atoms, compounds are always looking for stability. Now, what we learned in the react or in the lab is that some reactions will decrease the temperature of the solution. Some reactions will increase the temperature of the solution. And when dissociation um, of a solid, and when disassociating a solid into a liquid, it can increase or decrease the temperature of the solution. And so what we see is as chemical reactions occur, we see that we have increases and decreases. And then even when we have that disassociation or something dissolves, we're going to have a change in temperature. And so what we have to jump into is how we measure that temperature and what that heat transfer means. Now, the system, what we call the system, the system is a collection of molecules being studied. So this is what we would say would be inside the beaker, inside the test tube, wherever we're looking at the reaction. Now the surroundings, and this is an important thing to know the difference between our uh, system and our surroundings. Surroundings are everything else not in the system. So if we're studying something in the test tube, the atoms and molecules inside that test tube, that's the system. And then the test tube and everything else, that would be part of the surroundings. Now, our goal when we're looking at um, heat and how a heat transfer and everything else is to isolate the system from the surroundings. So we only want to have just the system and none of the surroundings. That's our job. Now we do this in a couple different ways. Um, the biggest way that we do this is using calorimeters um, and we'll talk a little bit more, th more about that later. Um, the next thing we're going to jump into is the first law of thermodynamics. And what it is, is that heat and work are forms of energy that cannot be created or destroyed, but can flow into and out of a system, what we just looked at. So energy can't be created or destroyed, only converted from one form to another. And we should have heard this before. It should sound somewhat familiar. We're just putting that it is the first law of thermodynamics. We might not have put that title to it yet. Um, we, we usually call it the law of conservation of mass and energy. Um, but when it, really what it is, it's the first law of thermodynamics. So where does all the energy come from? So we have these energy energies in the reaction. We have heat being given off or heat being absorbed. So things heating up or cooling down. Where does all that energy come from? Uh, this is interesting. The combustion of one gallon of gas is like 10 sticks of dynamite. Uh, the other thing we have is that one chocolate chip cookie has the same amount of energy as one stick of dynamite. And so what we can think of here is where does all the energy come from? Well, they 
how are they all similar? How are they all different? Well, inside, a cookie is very different than dynamite, and dynamite's very different than gasoline. So how are they similar? How are they different? Um, what we're looking at here is basically uh, we're looking at the energy coming from either chemical energy, chemical potential energy, kinetic energy, or thermal energy. What this means is that the chemical energy is going to be stored up in the bonds. It's going to be stored between holding the bonds together and it's that chemical potential, meaning it has potential energy. And then what happens is once that potential energy is changed, it can then transfer into kinetic energy. And energy kinetic energy is the energy of movement. Okay, so it can transfer from chemical potential into kinetic and then we can also have our thermal energy which that is our heat and so these things are going to come from all this energy is going to come from those chemical bonds and it's going to come from that change into kinetic in which changes our thermal energy or heat energy so all of this energy in a reaction let's talk about endothermic versus exothermic now endothermic and these are definitions that we need to know. Endothermic requires heat as a reactant. Okay, and endothermic requires heat as a reactant. And what we're looking at here is that we see that here, here's our reactant, and it takes, requires heat to get our process, to get our product. So it has to have heat input. Okay, we call heat input. If heat is being inputted into it, we say that that is positive. Okay, now exothermic, it produces heat as a product. So this would be backwards. So instead of going up the hill, what we would see is that for exothermic, we would have down the hill. So our reactants would be up here, our products would be down there this will have a negative main thing how we can simplify this endothermic it's going to feel cold endothermic is going to feel cold why does it feel cold well because it's if you're holding the beaker as the endothermic reaction is going on it's pulling heat from your hand into the beaker because it requires that heat and so therefore you feel your hand getting colder because the reaction is pulling the heat from your hand. Exothermic on the other hand if you're holding a beaker when an exothermic reaction is happening your hand gets warmer. Why? Because heat is produced and so it's flowing from the beaker from the reaction into your hand. Now all of this is the values depend on the state of the system. Um, internal energy depends on temperature, volume, and pressure. Um, what we can see of this is if we're traveling and we're going all around, all around, all around, and coming around like this, what we can see is if we started over here, it doesn't matter what path we take as long as we get to that point. So what we can kind of look at it this way, if I start right here and I travel this path to get there, it's the same as traveling from here to here. Basically what this means is that all those values depend on the state of the system and we're going to look a little bit more into enthalpy. Now what enthalpy is, uh, enthalpy is the way that m mathematically we can look at heat. Um, it's a combination of the three state functions. So it's a combination of taking our temperature, our volume, our pressure, and basically getting it to a point um, where we have an equation. Now, the combination of those three, pressure, volume, and temperature, um, and all of that and we get this equation. We're not going to use this equation um, but basically we can take this equation it all combines together and what we see is that we'll have this delta H. Now we're going to deal with a lot about delta H. We're going to deal with it in a different sense 
but delta H, and this is the main thing, um, is that this part down here. If delta H is positive, we have an endothermic reaction. If delta H is negative, we have an exothermic reaction. So that enthalpy um, is a state function, which we're not going to use this equation because it's a lot easier for us to discuss just the change in enthalpy. So this delta H, so the change in enthalpy. So how does it change? Final minus initial. Okay, so when we're looking at the enthalpy of the reaction, this is the equation that we're going to use. So basically all of that that I just talked about boils down to this equation, okay, where we have delta H equals the delta um, naught of our F, and this is our, our formation, okay, so this is the heat. So the enthalpy is basically related to heat. And so the heat of formation of our products minus the heat of formation of our reactants. Okay, so we're looking at basically all the heats that it take, took to get there and we're boiling it down into delta H. So delta H is enthalpy. It's a state function combining others often um, equated to heat and then we have our um, we have our delta F of our product the heat of formation and that should be down here and then the heat of formation of our reactants it's the change in enthalpy from the formation of one mole of the compound from its elements so basically what this means is that it's the heat that's required to get those from the elements into the compound so basically it's going back to this and saying that oops, it's saying that it's the heat required to go from this point to that point doesn't really matter how we got there but it's from this point to that point it's a measurement of that so taking those atoms and seeing how much heat is right, made. jumping into example a1 it says calculate the enthalpy of reaction as liquid water is converted into steam um, and so what we see on this is that we have H uh, H2O of a liquid going into H2O of a gas. And so we just set it up, delta H um, is going to get us our uh, negative 241, because that is our product, 0.882 minus a negative 285.8 and what we will see here is that we will get an answer of delta H right around a positive 43.98 um, and what we can say of this kilojoules is what we can say is that heat is required as a reactant to push this from a liquid into a gas uh, jumping into example A2, it says calculate the enthalpy of formation for calcium carbonate from uh, calcium oxide and our carbon dioxide. So in the reaction, we first have to write that down. We have calcium oxide, which is CaO, plus carbon dioxide, CO2, um, and it produces our... Um, calcium carbonate which is CaCO3. So we're going to use the same equation, the delta H equation equals our product which we have our um, the main thing and the other thing here to focus on is make sure that we have a nice balanced chemical equation because this is kilojoules per mole so if we had a different mole if we had two moles of co2 we'd have to multiply this by two to get it in the correct uh, ratio but all of these it's already balanced so it's all one so we can take this and set it up and our products which our product is going to be negative 1206.9 uh, minus our negative reactants and it will be the sum of these two so it will be our 
plus R393.5. And we go ahead and we add both of those guys together and they're both negative. So both of those together. And then basically we finish the equation and we get delta H is going to be our negative 178.36 and since it's negative we can say that that is going to be exothermic. So looking at Hess's law everything that we have been talking about all of that is essentially what Hess's law is. Now Hess's law uh, the definition of it um, it is that equation where it's delta H equals our delta H of our products minus delta H of our reactants. That is Hess's law, but the definition of it is the change in enthalpy overall is the sum for all the individual changes. So we are going to look at specifically at individual atoms and their heat of formation. And so when we're looking at individual parts, so like when iron forms with chlorine to form iron 2 chloride um, we have our heat of formation of that um, but when we have our iron forming with a, another uh, atom of chlorine to form iron 3 chloride what we see is that has a delta H as well and so when we're looking at the reactants um, reactions only depend on the amount the amount of reactions and not really the process. Um, basically whatever we start with will determine how much heat we can either produce or how much heat is going to be required uh, to get our products. It's not really about uh, the process of how we get there but just what we start with. And so basically what this boils down to same thing that we have been doing delta H equals our heat of formation of our products minus heat of formations of our reactants. Uh, we can look at this example. It says what is the enthalpy of reactions given? And so what we see is that we have our reactions and these are the heat of formations of each one of these. And so what we're looking at is we have our products reactants. One thing I will note here, any element um, is going to have in its natural state is going to have a heat of formation of zero. So that's why we don't have that. We have CO2 which is right here goes right there. We have our SO2 which is right here and we have our uh, CS2 which is this and that's going to be zero. So the the enthalpy of the reaction that delta H is still for even though these are individual reactions the delta H is still going to be our products minus our reactants. And just remember that this is zero. And so all we do is we take our products minus our reactants and that will give us our heat or what the enthalpy of the reaction.